I'm Shalina Tobin, aka Posh Nosh Girl, and today I'm joined by the fantastic chef Adam Handling. Adam's rise to the top of the culinary tree has been nothing short of incredible. He's gone from Glen Eagle's first ever trainee chef to winning GQ magazine's Restauranteur of the Year 2020. Adam now delights his patrons in their homes through his fantastic delivery service, Haim. His restaurants, which you may know, are Adam Handling Chelsea and one of my personal favorites, Frog in Covent Garden. Adam, how are you doing? I'm doing good, thanks. Good. Now, the last time we spoke, you had just moved out of your home and since then, you've lost two, I think, is it two or three of your restaurants, all because of the pandemic and, and the various lockdowns that we've had? Three restaurants and one bar, yeah. Yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's, you know, you've taken the worst situation possible and you've come up with, you've actually come up with a fantastic new business, Haim. So um, let's talk about it. You've converted your restaurant, Frog, for the time being to cater for Haim Deliveries. Uh, tell us, tell us about how you started it, and and you know what were you thinking when it when it all came about? I was probably a little bit late to the game in terms of creating uh, a home delivery. It was, uh, and I wasn't going to. Um, I was thinking, who's going to shut London down for more than a couple of weeks? It's it's London. It's the, one of the most powerful cities in the world. No one knew what was going on, and it wasn't until my landlord started demanding rent after the second month of lockdown, and I'm like, oof. That's a lot of money to be spending on all these properties worth of rent. I, I, I can't afford that. You know, we still had to pay the electricity bill, the gas bill, because we needed the cameras, we needed the CCTV, we needed all of that sort of thing. Um, it was, we have to do something. So um, we created Haim and it took two weeks from, from drawing the logo to having everything ready to rock and roll. Uh, and then we started executing out. Obviously we made a lot of mistakes along the way, and I think now the way that Haim is, it, it's, it's, it's beautiful. And it's, I think it's one of the best in the country, you know, a la carte dishes as well as packs, rather than just me telling you it's one box, one thing you can do. So I'm super proud of how much volume we're doing in particular uh, and the way that it's executed now. Yeah, and it is actually phenomenal. I, we've, we've ordered so many of your, of your boxes and also we've got valentine's day coming up we were we, we actually nice. really want to my husband was just like what are we doing for valentine's day i was like well i don't know but we're getting haim <laughs> so well, there's, there's a launch got. of two new two new two new things are launching on that one it's um a new duck dish so it's a whole salt aged mm. duck uh, which is incredible and um a brand new bottled cocktail uh, which is um called wild strawberry they both get released on the same on that one day oh exciting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, 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 don't even, I don't even know what's on the menu. I just said we're having it. So <laughs> Michael will know. Amazing. Good. <laughs> and you were actually delivering boxes yourself right in the beginning, weren't you? For the whole of the first lockdown. Yeah, it, it was me mm -hmm. on the first like week or two. And then after that, it became too busy. So then there was, it was me, Jamie, and then it got more busy after that. So it was like me, Maria and Jamie all in three cars delivering everything. And what, what kind of volume are you delivering now? Is it, I mean, per week? Per week, around about four and a half thousand dishes a week now around wow. the UK. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in terms of, because we also have a bottle shop as well, where you can get, you know, incredible, incredible wines that you won't be able to find anywhere else at like, it's, it's like 20% GP on there rather than 80, because um, mm -hmm. it's easy for us just to post it. So bottles of wine, we're maybe doing about 500 different bottles of wines and champagnes a week, cocktails, maybe about 2,000. Wow. Um, and that's all extra on top of it so it, you know it's, it's a huge volume but the gp to that is very low because it's phenomenal products um yeah it's for instance the caviar we buy our caviar at 23 pounds and we sell it at 25 you know it's um it's it's that sort of thing things like that the added value add mm. on to dishes right right and you know you said it took you two weeks to to just get on with the branding and putting it all together but you've really thought about every aspect from the branding to sustainability the instruction videos the packaging i mean it's all just come together so so well once we open up again will haim continue haim's about to move into its own venue 
it's that powerful yeah. and that big that uh, my, my actual, my restaurant in Covent Garden can't sustain it. The fridges aren't big enough. The freezer <laughs> space isn't big enough for the ice packs. The storeroom isn't for the, uh, for the boxes. I know, so I've seen about... like the entire, <laughs> I mean, you've taken over the entire restaurant. There's just boxes everywhere. <laughs> removed all the tables and chairs and it's, it's just it's crazy so yeah it's going to be going into its own standalone property very shortly amazing and then so you've got you've got people to manage that for you or are you gonna once you open up again how will you manage your time between both businesses so still from still from when i lost like frog hoxton and ugly butterfly and them sort of ones i i haven't i still haven't got rid of any staff you know furlough mm -hmm. schemes helped even though it's even though as an employer i top it up um, I, I top it up, pay national insurance, pay pension contribution. We still have a ridiculous amount that um, as a company we pay for, but if I let them go, man, I'm just heartless. Then people made my restaurant group what it is. So I have to protect them. Yeah. So I still have the team ready to rock and roll from these other restaurants to help create Haim. And then when, when a new restaurant then comes about, then we then put them back into another restaurant. Mm -hmm. So looking after the staff for me is, is the first thing that I do in my group when uh, when it shit hit the fan, really. Yeah, yeah, I know. I remember you saying um, everything, you know, everything was just for your staff, even moving out of your own home, um, yeah. which is, you know, it, it just says what kind of a person you are and you put your team first. Um, so I know, I mean, it, it's been a really hard for business, uh, hard year for businesses like yours, um, but you're such a fighter. And I actually heard that um, you got a lot of stick from other chefs when you started up Haim, why was that? <laughs> Man, when I started up Haim, Twitter was just like a bloody evil as hell. So many people slagged me about it, about no one wants to see a QR code of a chef cooking. They just want, you know, fish and chips or they want things like that. And I'm like, I'm rolling with the punches thinking, my God, am I, am I, am I actually doing something that's going to fail? Uh, and I'm questioning myself. Am I doing too much that it's not what people want? It's too expensive. It, it's that sort of thing. And then as Haim was so successful, you know, Forbes magazine, GQ, all of the big dogs yeah. gave it at the top because yeah. of the variety and, and the execution. And then I'm seeing all the other big chefs doing the same, which is phenomenal. You know, I'm not saying I, I created home deliveries. I most certainly didn't. But um, with the QR codes, with the cooking along, that sort of one. For me, it's just like too much hate out there. That's one main reason why I don't use Twitter. Too much hate. Yeah. And it, I mean, that, that surprised me because at a time when hospitality needs so much support, uh, it was it was just for you. It was just a bit of a backlash, which was just really, really strange. But I mean, you showed how resilient you are. And another example of that is actually when you first opened Frog. Let's talk about that. Um, I know that, you know, what should have been the most exhilarating moment for yeah. you was actually one of the lowest points that you've experienced in your career. Talk to us about what happened. So when creating Frog in Covent Garden, it was, uh, it was my dream. You know, this was the flagship restaurant. Yeah. It cost more millions than I would have ever imagined that is going to take me still another few years to pay off. And it was all planned out. One year to build which was already massively delayed and um, error after error from the architects, from the construction workers, from everything like that. When it came to opening night, we couldn't really practice uh, soft opening as much as we would have wanted. All the power went down on our opening night. Uh, already the building um, was drawing too much power that the downstairs kitchen and the downstairs PDR had no power. This one then flipped it to upstairs blue as well. And I'm like, this is the first service. Uh, I'm heartbroken. I haven't been sleeping. You know, I, I've been sleeping like less than an hour in that property. And then all the power went down. We, were, we had the barbecues on. We're trying to do it. Everyone's stumbling over themselves. It's just becoming crazy. And I just broke down. I was just like, I can't do it. And I just, in front of everyone, bawled my eyes out. I ran in the disabled toilets because that's the closest one to the kitchen upstairs. And I locked myself in there. I just, I just, I didn't know what to do. It's like you're pushing a wall. Uh, and, and it broke me. And then um, Stephen and Stephen and Johnny, you know, they've been with me for years. They would never let me down. They're like, we can still do this. They're still pushing on. They're like, you know, try. And I'm, and then I, about a fucking an hour later, I come out. I, I couldn't breathe. I, I literally had a panic attack. 
I came out, he, they're trying and it's just not working. So then I told, I went out and told the guests, I'm like, I'm so sorry, we're going to have to close. And they were like, we, this is no problem at all. We followed you from our, your other restaurants. Don't worry. And then I'm trying, you know, my bottom lips covering and to tell them I, I'm, I fucked up, you know, it's my fault again at the restaurants, not ready. And uh, every single one of them has been a continued long serving customer with us. And is, that's amazing, amazing to see. And the icing on the cake was the architect did not give me the bloody keys for the restaurant front door. And I had to sleep in the front of the restaurant where it's all glass with the doors wide open on a bloody, um, on a, a restaurant chair. Oh they my didn't God. give me the keys. And it was a Friday. Friday was our first service. And they didn't give me the keys until Monday. That's oh how God. stupid they were. But it, a, a year later, we finally won a legal lawsuit and I sued the shit out of them because they literally ruined all my dreams. And fundamentally, we went that more over budget that um, it, I almost bankrupted the entire company. Good grief. If I didn't, I had friends that are... Um, that lent me money to keep it open, but I mean, not small amounts of money. They're lending me, you know, three, four, five hundred thousands at a time to 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 help me keep it open because we couldn't do the capacity and we couldn't do that. And the architects, they ruined everything. They ruined my dreams. They 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 ruined that site. I hate them. Wow, I, I can I can really feel it. I can feel that pain, and I can't imagine how tough it must have been for you. And that first day, I mean, was that? Did you have like was that industry critics and press those kind of people there as well? Yeah, but ones that have been. We always only invite people that truly believe in the brand, because we understand that there could be some speed bumps along the road, right. and any new operation always speed bumps. But we don't expect it to be, you know, a catastrophic disgrace of the of like the night it was. So yeah. it was, yeah, sh chef friends, uh, critic friends, and um, and regulars from other restaurants. So, oh, that's quite shocking. So, so basically, spending the night outside the restaurant because you obviously want to keep it safe. Uh, you know, anything could happen. So many things went wrong, not just having to try and cook the food on, on the barbecue as well. I mean, it was, that must have been really, really difficult. How, I mean, how do you move past that? I mean, you're, I have heard, I mean, this is probably the worst opening story that I've heard. I've heard some others, but how do you keep your mental, your, your mental state of mind calm how do you get over it because that is a real turmoil your baby your restaurant everything's going wrong you've got the financial struggles to go with it as well how do you keep yourself because look you're past the other side now there was light mm -hmm. at the end of the tunnel but you must have at the time you must have thought this is just complete darkness I don't know how I'm going to come out of this what were the things that really helped you pull through there are two things one of them is the team that are around me, you know, Stephen, our group chef, 13 years, Johnny, our um, Chelsea chef, who's been with me like a lot. All my main people, my senior staff have been with me well before this restaurant's even open. Excuse me. And the one thing from them was they would never let it fail. They would come over, give me a cut and say, what the hell do you need me to do? And I'll do it. You know, I need a push. We're working all through the night to get this ready. Let's get it done. You know, um, it, it, there was no about their personal life they didn't care about. It was, we're in this together. I believe in you. I followed you for so long. I'm going to not, I'm, I'm going to be there with you. And if it goes down, it's going to take us both down. That's the ethos there. The second one was, and if I'm 100% honest, the amount of hatred that's out there. That's my other main drive to success. I go on Twitter or other chefs and they're slagging the shit out of me because they just don't think I deserve what we have that or I'm doing something wrong that amount of hatred for me makes me not want to hear in the back of my mind I told you he would fail he's shit he's been handed everything all of that rubbish which I worked my ass off to achieve all of all of the the negativity out there I won't give him the satisfaction to prove them right so you That's use that as ammunition system. hugely even like not getting a Michelin star you know, I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to blame Michelin. I'm not going to blame COVID. I'm not going to blame that they didn't come in because they were uh, there. I'm going to blame myself and just improve what we can do better. 
So, you know, the lighting, little bits and bobs, now that we can say, that could be a little bit better, let's do it. You know, this could be better, this dish could be more refined, let's do it. So all the, all the, the speed bumps, all the negativity, all the anger out there, ironically, as much as they think it's gonna trip me up, it fires me up hugely. And then I turn it around and I'm like, let's, let's not make it fail. I cannot have this guy say this about me, that about me anymore, I'm gonna keep fighting. And the team, the team do it too. We want to prove it to ourselves that we can do a good restaurant. Yeah, you're proving it. You're not even. You're not only proving it through your restaurant, but you're also proving it through your deliveries, which um, <laughs> which I love. You it's know. massively successful. It is. It is. And and there's a reason for that. You're doing everything right. Um, you just mentioned Michelin, so let, let's talk about that. The awards were just now on on Monday night. I was gutted, Adam. Um, honestly, I, I can't lie about it. I was really gutted that you didn't get a star. Um, how 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 do you feel about it? Last time we spoke, you were you know you were feeling more and more confident, and you know you were really going for it. How how do you feel about it? And um, and tell me what you know what what emotions did you go through? How I feel about it now, being a few days ago to how I was two weeks, was two very, very different things. A few weeks ago, um, I, I was a nervous wreck to a point where I couldn't work as, as, um, as, as focused as I should be, as I usually am. Because in the back of my mind, my heart, I kept having panic attacks about, am I going to get it? Am I going to get it? And that uncertainty messed with my head. You know, I was not sleeping at all. If I'm honest, I had to have sleeping tablets to get to sleep because um, I needed to work. So, um, but I, I wasn't convinced I was going to get one. I thought I was going to get one with a, a glimmer of hope. And then when I'm watching and then no phone call, no nothing. And I'm knowing from other chefs that they've had a phone call, they filmed it. And I'm thinking maybe they just don't film at all pre, they, they, they call people on the day. Um, and I'm watching it and my heart is just sinking more and more and more. And it's, for me, not just me getting it, because, okay, I may think I deserve it, but I'm biased, I love the product. There could be elements that could be improved as an overall building and um, as an overall restaurant experience. So that will then make it stronger for the next time. But I was, I was broken. Um, I watched it in my private dining room because we were finishing work for, for Haim that day. So all of the heads of department were watching it. We had some pizzas and, and um, I tried to stay very, very strong for the team because it wasn't just me that, that it, was, it, hurt, it hurt everyone. Um, and then after that, I couldn't stay and have a drink with them at all. I had to leave. So I got in my car, went home and I just went to my room and I bawled my eyes out. I could not my I, I I was broken I didn't I didn't understand I didn't understand what I did wrong because I thought I really did I worked so hard to make that restaurant amazing in a way when you come back to it when we reopen again I guarantee you'll be like it's probably a good reason you didn't get one because now it's even better I always want to become better than I was yesterday sometimes you need a total kick in the face um uh, to become even stronger. But the Michelin Awards this year, I thought were, were, were not necessarily fair in terms of the amount of restaurants that got issued new stars in, in the UK. I think the UK is, is an incredible, incredible uh, country for food. I think London is the food capital of the world. And the amount of new one stars that got given out in comparison to France the week before, I, I thought that wasn't particularly fair at all. There are so many more restaurants deserving of one, not just meaning my, I think mine too, but so many more deserve one that didn't get it. Mm. I was super proud that there was, you know, three more two stars and two three stars. It, it needs more, it needs more of them and all them restaurants I absolutely love. So I was super proud to, uh, to see the UK gain some more of them. But in terms of one stars, I think Michelin were slightly tough on the UK this year. Yeah, it's been a really, uh, I mean, it's been an extraordinary year um, where, you know, we've been closed for a lot of the time as well. And, you know, I don't know exactly how it works, but how they manage to get around to all the restaurants and find the time, I, I just don't know how, how they've managed to do it. But, you know, to award someone a star, you've got to have 
gone to all the other restaurants because you can't you know you can't issue it to one and just say oh sorry I didn't have time to go to <laughs> to another restaurant um yeah. but yeah I agree with you there's so many fantastic restaurants in London and you know who 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 weren't awarded a star again um I've got a list of favorites I can't, just can't believe in you know you're you know you're one of them just can't just can't believe it but like when you, you said back, it's, you'll yeah. love it even more yeah, that exactly. So what are the things that you've changed? What what do you think that is going to make that difference? So in terms of the way that experience is, we're removing even more tables from the restaurant now uh, so that we can make it slightly more slower paced and less noisy. The one thing I loved about my restaurant group is I like it noisy, I like it fast paced, and I like the informality, but no compromise on really great wines and really great food. That's what I love. But I think perhaps at the level that we're doing and maybe the prices that we're charging for Covent Garden restaurant, we need to slow it down a bit, make it slightly more an experience rather than um, a, a fast paced, uh, you know, loud restaurant. So we're, uh, you know, removing some tables, changing all the lighting, adding a lot of uh, foliage. So with the decorations of the restaurant is going to be a little bit more um, uh, foraged style look um because we use a lot of uh, foraged items on the on the menu so um more textures there different crockery so to make it more more simple rather than handmade handmade crockery and the menu man i've been working on this thing all guns blazing <laughs> all guns blazing and it's going to be i think the best menu we've ever done we've been given a phenomenal opportunity to 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 close it's um it's good and bad it's, it's good because it allows him to succeed and it allows me to really concentrate on creating the new menu. Bad because obviously restaurants are shut and people are struggling. Yeah. So you take the good with the bad and yeah. I'm taking more positive out of this than negative. Yeah, yeah, you absolutely are. And um, I don't know where you've, you've found the time. You've been so busy with Haim. Where have you found the time to develop a new menu? I literally, I work every day. What else is there to do? I don't work on Sundays because <laughs> that's my day with Oliver, yeah. um, my, my son. But other than that, I, I, yeah, I work every day. Um, it, could, it doesn't need to be in the restaurant. I could just be in the house. I could be, I'm in my office in my house here. It could be just, you know, writing, creating, sourcing, um, mm. you know, down, down to sourcing a specific mold or a specific um, uh, duck or anything like that. And that's easy. I, I'm watching TV on my laptop sort of thing uh what else is there to do yeah yeah I'm not one to be sitting on my bum just you know mincing about in front of the tv <laughs> or, or chatting to posh nosh gal all day long <laughs> <laughs> that I like oh, well you have so much passion and and love for what you do you live and you breathe to achieve your goals that you set for yourself um you just mentioned your little one Oliver how how does such a disciplined work ethic impact your social or family life? Family-wise, it uh, uh, not so well, um, not so well at all. Uh, yeah, um, I work a lot, and uh, and sometimes I'm a little bit blinded. You know, I'm wearing them, uh, I'm wearing blinkers that I can't see from the side, where I I, I lose focus of what's important as an overall person uh, and yeah that's something I need to grow on as a as a, an individual my work cannot control my life or I'll, I'll lose everyone um, but spending a day with my son every Sunday is, is allowing me to switch off um, and really you know have fun have fun it's great he he, he eats a lot my god the guy is like a little yeah he eats so much and and he really is he's not fussed he eats really nice food and we make the most out of it you know we sit at the dinner table uh he's eating same as what i am and um and enjoying it gosh he sounds like everyone's dream child eats everything that you do that's that is amazing so adam getting a little more personal now with regards to romantic relationships does work take precedence? Um, work takes over. Work, work does take over. My uh, Oliver's mum, 
was an amazing person, an absolutely amazing person, super beautiful, very, very talented and uh, the, the nicest heart ever. And I fucked it up because I worked too much, fundamentally. That's, yeah, you need to think, I need to reevaluate life uh, and if I want to settle down. I've always used the excuse, I'm still too young. I'm still too young to, to, to not take my foot off my career path. I've always said, when my foundations are set, I can slow down. Your goals always move. You'll never achieve your goals because whenever you become close, you then think of something else that you want to achieve that kind of like overshadows the previous. Mm. If we think about my goals 16 years ago when I did it, I've surpassed them by far, mm. but you'll never achieve them because you'll always just say, actually, no, I want another restaurant or I want a mission start or I want this to be that and this to be that. And you, me personally, I, I, I'm blind, blinded by um, career. And I think that's quite a lot of professional people do the same. And I always say foundations aren't set, goals aren't achieved, and I'm still too young. <laughs> My foundations are set. I'm getting bloody old. I need to start to think um, there are, yeah, people that I let into my life, which I'm not a very open person at all, and these sort of things, they, 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 they love me, they look after me. I need, I need to show them more respect uh, and slow down from work and, and enjoy life. Yeah, this is so personal, Adam. Thank you for being so open. But please don't call yourself old again because you make me feel really <laughs> old. <laughs> yeah. I feel really old when you say things like that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I guess, I mean, my, um, so a little example, my husband, actually, he's, he's divorced and he was divorced when I met him. And he says that, you know, after, after that experience, he actually has a much healthier, a much better relationship. He's got three children and he's got a much better relationship with them because the time that he and we spend with them is 100% about them. We're completely devoted to them. Is that what you feel with Oliver now? Like you just, you just kind of, you know, you take that time out and Sundays are just his only. Well, to be fair, doing that I'm spending more time with him than I was when I lived with him you know and that's yeah. crazy I, I, I live with my son but I will be at work whilst he's still asleep I come home he's still asleep I, you take for granted what's right in front of you yeah uh, and, it, and it, it takes you it takes you the uh, for to lose something to really switch back and think wow I lost it all what am I doing you know, yeah, and I think that's with anything really. Um, restaurants, personal life, anything. When you lose something, you understand that, mm, I think it's me I got to look at. Yeah, but you know, there was always other opportunities. So, you know, when you feel like, you know, you're ready or you've achieved enough, I know you're saying that, you know, your goals always change and, and they're going to keep growing. And, and I think that's, that is an amazing thing. Um, because you're constantly evolving as a person. But then when you want to finally settle down and, and evolve with someone, I mean, there's so many people in the industry, the industry that you're in, every, a lot of people have got a lot of similar work ethics. So chefing can be quite taxing with the long hours, the late nights, weekends. What would your advice be to people with regards to work-life family balance? I think if, you, if, if you're going to be selfish enough to have a family, wake the hell up and be a, be, be a family. That's what I would say to myself as well. If I was selfish enough to, to have a child, I should have taken more responsibility and uh, been a better father. Well, you're certainly making up for it. A child that eats everything you give him, that's pretty good parenting if you ask me. But having, having a partner that is part of the business seems to work incredibly well for some. I mean, they understand the long hours, their goals and their values are the same. It's quite rare and, and special to find that. That would be my dream, to, to have my partner be my number two. 
um, or or being a part of the business that that they understood and and um, helped me drive forward. Uh, ironically, that was what my, uh, my 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 partner did. She she was in the business, but for me, because I'm probably selfish in a way where my my life is my work. That's the selfish element. I would take it home. There would never be a time where we were on a holiday that I wasn't telling her, have you done my email yet? Have you done this or, 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 or you know, edit this or do that. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing where it's just like, at the time I'm like, well, let's work, man. I own the company, you know, you're my, you're, you're my partner in crime. You know, you work in the group. We need to make sure that every single day that we're, we're, we're in this game, we make it work. And, I have no idea how I can be with somebody in hospitality ever again because it broke us and it was my fault. I don't think it's about fault. And what I mean when I say that is, you know, you're living your purpose. You're incredibly ambitious, driven, and your sole focus is your business. And wild horses couldn't hold you back. And that's just where you are with yourself at this moment in time this year in particular i've got too much going on this year is going to be our best year yet as soon as lockdown's lifted of course and when you find out what i've got planned i have no time to date anyone (laughs) (laughs) can you tell me anything about what you've got planned you'll be the first person i do tell (laughs) when uh, when something's about to happen but sadly i can't okay well you know it has been a pretty big year for you already. Your devotion to your business won you. GQ Restauranter of the Year 2020. Clearly a massive industry achievement for you. Tell me about the moment you found out, were you expecting it? I mean, tell me everything, I wanna know. Okay, I wasn't expecting to, um, to, to win it or to anything. I was really honored to be nominated, but I, I saw from um, Tom Brown that he posted that he won chef of the year like two days before and I was just like oh they've clearly told all the winners then I haven't I haven't won it great for him he's a great chef um but I was like oh, I didn't win my, I didn't win my one so you know I got over it and I was actually on a speed awareness course in my house because uh, I got caught speeding I was only going 36 in the 30 zone but it was neither here nor there it was wrong right. um so I was on there and my phone had to be switched off but my phone was still on um and my my social media was going crazy and I'm like, what's going on? And I click on it and I'm like, holy shit, I just won restaurant tour of the year. You know, I was just, you know, beaming. I was on mute, so they, they didn't hear me. <laughs> and, it, and it was just like, wow, I did not expect that whatsoever. Um, I was up against some phenomenal chefs. Um, and for me, that made me feel a little bit like, okay, I think I'm doing a good job. Mm-hmm. I, my dream, my dream before getting a star or anything was GQ. Oh no before. way! That, that yeah, I've always <laughs> loved that magazine. If you're in there, you you know you are you're doing something you're correct. Wow. And um, when I achieved that, that was that was phenomenal, phenomenal. Um, I love that magazine and and their influences that I think ch- uh, changed the dynamic of what the UK's fashion, food, um, style is. And for them to say I'm doing something right, it made me feel so so happy. Yeah, massively. Yeah, what a, what a phenomenal achievement. I, I think that's brilliant. Adam, I know so much about you. I love everything that I know. You're such a fantastic guy. Could you tell me something that I couldn't possibly know? I never, ever admit to this, and I don't think I've told near enough anyone, but um, my mother is uh, my mother's English um, and my dad's Scottish, but I always say that I'm like a full blood Scot. <laughs> Uh, I'm, you know, born in Scotland. I am Scottish. I'm proud to be Scottish. I love haggis. I love everything about Scotland. And I never like to admit it, nor ever have I told anyone that my mum's English. So does that make me half Scottish? (laughs) I never want to admit to the English part because I'm proud to be Scottish, but I think it does. I just don't admit to it. Well, that's so funny because, yeah, (laughs) I I never would have guessed that, actually. And, um, Uh, yeah, I think... It doesn't make you less proud and and it shouldn't. Actually, I've got really, I think this is a really cool fact for you. Um, 
King James VI was king of Scotland, but was actually a descendant of Henry VII, who was king of England. So oh. did that make him half English, half Scottish too? <laughs> <laughs> and, he was, and he was the first king to unite England and Scotland. Wow, wow, okay. And also, I bet you that you didn't know this either, Nicola Sturgeon, her grandmother was English from Sunderland. Really? Yeah. I did. didn't expect that. Didn't so expect that at all. Wow. two really strong, determined individuals who were half Scottish and half English. Well, that would prefer both to be more Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> we'll never know. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Adam, in our first interview together, you said you wanted to be the best you can possibly be. And through this pandemic, you've 100% outdone yourself despite everything that you've had thrown at you. I love your never give up fighting spirit and absolutely you are the best. Thank you so much for chatting with me and sharing such personal stories. I always love chatting with you. It was great. <laughs> If you guys um, want to know more about Adam's career, we cover that in my first interview with him. So you can find that on my podcast or my IGTV page uh, on Instagram, which is at Posh Nosh Gal. And Adam's Instagram handle is Adam Handling. And if you enjoyed today's interview, please subscribe, rate and review. Apparently, it'll help others find me. <laughs>